July 18, 1943, a dusty, scorching artillery field near Catania. Sicily, the air is a chaotic symphony of violence, the tearing whoosh of incoming German shells, the deafening crump of explosions, and the constant, high-pitched scream of suffering. Private Andrew Andy Miller, a medic with the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, RCAMC, presses himself flat against the sun-baked earth behind a low, crumbling stone wall. The smell of sulphur and freshly churned dust is overwhelming. Suddenly, a Canadian infantryman, Sergeant Thomas Rourke, tumbles backward into the shallow trench, his face the color of bleached bone. A piece of shrapnel, a jagged, thumb-sized piece of steel, has ripped a massive wound high on his thigh. The wound is gushing blood, soaking the parched Sicilian soil instantly. Miller scrambles to Rourke's side. He immediately clamps a field dressing onto the wound, applying maximum pressure. Rourke is already slipping into hypovolemic shock, the deadly consequence of severe blood loss. His pulse is thready, his skin are clammy, and his eyes are rolling back in his head. Rourke, stay with me. Pal, stay awake, Miller yells. Though this sergeant is beyond hearing, Miller knows the bloody calculus of the front line. A soldier hit like this rarely survives. The blood loss is too fast, too catastrophic. The established medical doctrine, honed since the trenches of the Great War, is clear. Stabilize the wound, load the casualty, and pray he survives the agonizing journey to the casualty clearing station, CCS, miles behind the lines. In this chaotic, primitive field environment, the only immediate fluid replacement available is usually saline solution, salt water. Saline can maintain fluid volume, but it carries none of the vital red blood cells needed to transport oxygen. It merely buys a few desperate hours. By the time Rourke reaches a fixed hospital, if he ever does, his body will have crossed the irreversible threshold of fatal exsanguination. Miller looks desperately toward the rear. The official Canadian blood transfusion service does exist, and units of prepared blood are stored at major field hospitals. But that blood is too far away, stored in fragile glass bottles inside bulky refrigeration units. It is an impossible lifeline for Rourke, dying right now on the contested front line, this deadly gap between the moment of wounding and the moment of transfusion, the golden hour that saves lives is the cruel reality of 1943 warfare. The system is centralized, bureaucratic, and utterly incapable of keeping pace with the pace and geography of mechanized war. Yet, a radical, almost forbidden idea, conceived by a volatile, fiercely compassionate Canadian doctor a decade earlier in the trenches of the Spanish Civil War, promised to change everything. His name was Dr. Norman Bethune. His revolutionary demand was simple. Bring the blood to the soldier, not the soldier to the blood. Miller, watching Rourke's life drain away into the thirsty earth, knew that until that change came, countless men would continue to die of this terrible, needless hemorrhage. 1937, the Spanish Civil War, Aragon Front. Long before the vast, mechanized conflict of World War II began, the blueprints for saving half a million lives were being drawn in the dusty, chaotic field hospitals of the Spanish Civil War. Here, Dr. Norman Bethune. A brilliant but fiercely unconventional thoracic surgeon from Gravenhurst, Ontario, witnessed the same agonizing process Private Miller was experiencing years later in Sicily, men bleeding to death simply because blood couldn't reach them fast enough. Medical science knew how to keep blood from clotting using sodium citrate. It knew how to store it briefly in refrigeration, but the rigid, established doctrine decreed that blood donation and storage must occur in pristine, permanent city hospitals and transfusions should only happen after the patient had endured the journey back to a fixed surgical unit. The logistics of the front line, the sheer distance and danger, 
made this procedure a death sentence for the severely wounded. Bethune saw this absurdity not as a logistical problem, but a moral failure. His solution was radical and, to the conservative medical establishment, utterly heretical. A mobile blood transfusion unit. He didn't wait for permission. Bethune cobbled together a small, dedicated team and acquired a rudimentary vehicle, a battered car or van. His system was simple yet revolutionary. He would drive into the cities, take blood donations from healthy civilians right there on the spot, and then, critically, transport the collected blood forward to temporary stations closer to the fighting. The blood was stored in ice-packed containers, maintained at the optimal low temperature, ready to be administered the moment a casualty was stabilized. This was not merely a convenient addition. It was a fundamental shift in strategy. It cut the deadly time lag from hours to minutes, treating hemorrhagic shock before it became terminal. Bethune's unit, the Servicio Canadiens de Transfusion de Sangre, demonstrated success immediately. Lives that were universally lost under the old system were suddenly being saved. However, the medical orthodoxy back in North America and Britain reacted with scorn. Transporting blood across bumpy roads in uncontrolled temperatures was seen as reckless, risking contamination and spoilage. They considered Bethune, with his fervent communist leanings and flamboyant disregard for bureaucracy, a rebel whose methods were forbidden by conventional wisdom. Bethune, dismissed and ridiculed by many of his peers, eventually left Spain, taking his revolutionary methods with him. He failed to see his vision fully adopted during the Spanish Civil War. But the principle he established, centralized collection, mass refrigeration, and mobile distribution to the point of injury, was too powerful to ignore. As World War II erupted, the Allies faced mass casualties from mechanized warfare that dwarfed the Spanish conflict. The sheer volume of wounded men suffering from shrapnel and blast injuries demanded a solution. The British Army, and, crucially, the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, RCAMC, recognized that if they did not adopt a system like Bethune's, their field hospitals would simply become morgues. The quiet, organized work of the Canadian medical apparatus would take Bethune's radical, often chaotic genius and translate it into a reliable mass production system. The focus shifted from the forbidden mobile collection to the reliable storage and industrial scale shipment of blood. The question was no longer if blood could be stored, but how to collect enough, process it into easily shippable units and get it across oceans and continents to men like Sergeant Rourke, dying right now in Sicily. 1940. Connaught Laboratories, Toronto, Canada. The quiet laboratories of the University of Toronto's Connaught Antitoxin and Therapeutic Serum Laboratories became the proving ground for industrial-scale blood storage. This was the critical next step after Bethune's field experiments, turning a radical, risky battlefield procedure into a safe, reliable, mass-produced medical necessity. The challenge was immense. How do you collect thousands of units of blood safely? How do you maintain a consistent, sterile temperature across the continent and then across the brutal, exposed environment of the Atlantic and onward to the African desert or the European front? The solution lay in two key Canadian innovations, standardization and logistics. First, Canadian scientists perfected the preservation formula, they standardized the use of the citrate dextrose solution, which significantly extended the viable shelf life of whole blood. This allowed blood to be collected centrally, tested rigorously, and prepared for transport with a shelf life that could actually withstand the journey. Second, Canada pioneered the use of the Pyrex glass bottle in the development of specialized temperature-controlled shipping containers. These weren't crude ice boxes. They were engineered systems designed to maintain the precious cargo at the necessary 4 pydes, 30 90s. Regardless of the scorching heat of a North African summer or the deep freeze of a Russian winter, 
This work laid the groundwork for the Canadian Red Cross Blood Transfusion Service, established in 1940. It was an organizational marvel that mirrored Bethune's core principle, centralized collection for decentralized, mobile distribution, massive public campaigns, urging Canadians to donate, generated a constant, reliable supply. The blood, once processed and bottled at Connaught and other centres, became a standardised, shippable commodity, the liquid gold of the Allied war effort. The impact was immediate and measurable. By standardising the handling and shipment of whole blood, Canada allowed the Allied forces to finally deploy what Bethune had dreamed of, mobile transfusion capability right behind the forward lines. The RCAMC and its British counterparts began equipping forward medical units, the field dressing stations, FDS, and casualty clearing stations, CCS, with refrigerated stores of type O, universal donor blood. A soldier like Sergeant Rourke, instead of receiving only saline solution, could now receive a life-saving whole blood transfusion within the golden hour of injury, often within minutes of being pulled from the front line. This pre-surgical infusion meant that by the time he reached the main surgical tents, his body wasn't already shutting down from shock. The resulting drop in battlefield mortality rates from hemorrhagic shock was staggering. Doctors could now perform emergency surgery on men who, just a few years earlier, would have been considered hopeless. The Canadian work transformed blood transfusion from a final, desperate measure in a city hospital into a routine, immediate stabilizing procedure at the very edge of the battlefield. The rebellious idea of one man had been scaled into an industrial, life-saving reality. The flow of Canadian blood, bottled, chilled, and shipped across the globe, was now directly reducing the bloody calculus of the front line. September 1944. A mud-caked field dressing station near the Scheldt Estuary, Netherlands. The battle for the Scheldt is a grinding, brutal affair. Mud, cold, and devastating close-quarters combat. The casualties streaming into the FDS, a collection of large canvas tents shielded behind a berm, are almost all suffering from severe shrapnel wounds and blast injuries. Inside tent A, Captain Eleanor Vance, RCAMC, a forward-deployed surgeon, works with grim efficiency. A young soldier from the Black Watch, Private Ian McLeod, is brought in on a stretcher. His leg is nearly severed by a mine, and the shock has already turned his skin a deathly grey. His pulse is almost undetectable. Status, Vance snaps to the assisting medic. Massive blood loss. Captain, barely conscious. BP dropping fast. Before the Canadian medical innovations, MacLeod would have been a lost cause. A man to be given morphine and comforted until he died because there was no time to get him to the main surgical hospital miles away. But this is 1944. The system, fueled by the industrial effort back in Toronto and the radical principles pioneered by Bethune, has changed everything. Get me whole blood, typo, refrigerated, and warm the line. Vance orders. The medic moves to a sturdy, Canadian-built insulated container nearby. It is heavy, painted olive drab, and secured with heavy latches. Inside, packed around dry ice and insulation, are dozens of standardized Pyrex bottles of blood, ready to go. The liquid gold, shipped thousands of miles, is sitting twenty yards from the front line. Within minutes, MacLeod is receiving a rapid, life-saving transfusion directly into his arm. The difference is instantaneous, visible, as the red cells flood his veins, his pallor slowly begins to change. The thready pulse gains strength. His body temperature stabilizes. The blood does not heal his physical wounds, but it brings him back from the precipice of hypovolemic death. It buys Captain Vance the critical time, the golden hour and beyond, to stabilize the wound, prepare him for the long transfer,
and eventually performed the complex surgery required to save his leg and his life. This scene was repeated across every major Allied campaign, from the beaches of Normandy to the brutal push across the Rhine. The ability to give immediate, pre-surgical blood on the battlefield dramatically altered the survival rates of combat casualties. The records kept by the Canadian Red Cross and the RCAMC illustrate the colossal scale of this life-saving logistical feat. By 1945, the service had collected and shipped over two million units of blood products across the globe for use by Allied armies. While not every unit was used on the front lines, the system's capacity ensured that blood was always available where it mattered most. The overall battlefield mortality rates for shrapnel and trauma, the primary causes of death that induced hemorrhagic shock, saw an unprecedented drop. Historians and medical statisticians later calculated that the centralized, refrigerated, and mobile transfusion system, built upon the foundation of Bethune's once forbidden concept and perfected by Canadian industry, was directly responsible for saving the lives of hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers and sailors. The soldier who once died on the dusty ground like Sergeant Rourke's comrade in Section 1 now lived because a brilliant, rebellious doctor in Spain insisted the blood belonged at the front and a nation of organized scientists and donors in Canada made sure it got there.